لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد so we gather here today to start off a class on the 40 hadith collection of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. Before we actually start the class on the hadith, there are a few questions that we need to address. The first question and the most obvious one is, who is Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi? And why are we studying his book? So who is Imam Nawawi? Question number one. Question number two, why are we studying his book? After we've answered these two questions properly, then we're ready to actually study the book itself. So who is Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi? Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi's actual name is Muhyuddin Abu Zakariya Yahya ibn Sharaf. Muhyuddin Abu Zakariya Yahya ibn Sharaf. So in the Arabs, when they would call on someone, there were three methods they would use to refer to that person. One of the three methods was a laqab. A laqab was a praiseworthy title given to that person because of something they've achieved. So Muhyuddin was his laqab. Because he dedicated so much of his life to hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and fiqh and all the different sciences. They say there wasn't a science that he studied, but he did not annotate his books on those sciences, meaning providing his own thoughts, his own reflections, his own research. So therefore he was given the title, title Muhyuddin. The reviver of the deen. And there were many scholars in the past who were given such beautiful titles. Imam al Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, he was called Hujjatul Islam. That him being a Muslim was a proof that Islam was the true religion. I mean, a man so intellectual, a man so deep in his knowledge, there were scholars that went as far as saying for Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, that he had all of the knowledge present to him. All the knowledge that was present to him, he had it all in his brain. And Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi was definitely one of those people. Now, his kunya is Abu Zakariya. Now, you'll learn up ahead. Actually, let me just define what a kunya is. The kunya is when you call a person while making reference to their male child. Generally, it's the oldest male child. And we will learn soon, inshallah, that Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi had no male child. So why was he called Abu Zakariya? We'll talk about it there, inshallah. What was his birth name? His birth name was Yahya. Yahya ibn Sharaf. He was born in, a, in the southern part of Damascus, in a small town, a small village known as Nawa, in the year 631 after Hijri. And because he was born in this town Nawa, this is why he is more commonly known as Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, making reference to the city he was born in. Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi was not born to a family of scholars. There are some scholars who are born to a family of scholars. So for example, one of the famous scholars of Medina Munawwara, um, Qasim bin Muhammad. He is known as one of the leading scholars of Medina Munawwara of his time. Qasim bin Muhammad was a son of Muhammad bin Abi Bakr and his, his grandfather Abu Bakr was the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when you look at that family he comes to, Qasim, the son of Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, who was a direct student of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the successor of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see the richness in the family and also you understand where that knowledge came from. It was transferred from generation to generation. Now, Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi didn't come from such a family. His father was a businessman and he was a famous merchant. He gave most of his time to buying and selling, buying and selling. However, even though his father was a merchant, he was known for having a, an inclination towards the deen. And not only just any inclination, he was known for being pious and righteous. So one thing the scholars, they point out here, is that even though you may not be a scholar yourself, as long as you have inclination towards the deen, it's very possible Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you children from your offspring who will be scholars and imams of the deen who will be Imams of the Deen, inshaAllah al-Aziz. Now, Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, from a, young, from a young age, he was a different child. He wasn't the kid who wanted to spend all this time on Xbox. He didn't enjoy going to the movies so much. Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, wasn't a big fan of the Olympics, or boxing, or soccer, or basketball. He was one of those kids who actually didn't like sports at all. He didn't like playing at all. 
His friends would mock him, they would joke about him, that saying to him, what kind of kid are you? You don't like playing? All kids like to play, right? Isn't that just inside us? So here Imam Nawi rahmatullahi never had a desire to play. His friends used to actually force him to play. There was one incident that one time his friends were forcing him to play and he had no desire. So he was pushing himself out of the playground, you know, pulling himself out of the playground and sitting on the side and reading some verses of the Qur'an, just entertaining himself by reading the ayat of the Qur'an. And while he was reading, there was a shaykh that was passing by that saw the whole scene of his friends kind of forcing him to play, him disengaging from the playground and then going to the side and playing. So this shaykh, this imam went to, he was a traveler by the way, this shaykh was not a resident, he was a traveler. He went to Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi and said to him, do you have a local teacher, a mu'allim? He said, yes I do. He said, take me to your teacher. So Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi took the shaykh to his teacher. The shaykh went to the teacher and said, if you are the teacher of this young student, I ask you to please give him extra attention because he will be one of the imams of the future. He will be an imam of this ummah. So this teacher was a little skeptical. He said, how do you know? Are you some kind of murajim, some sort of fortune teller or some person that looks into the stars and tells us what's going to happen in the future? How do you know? So he said, this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put inside my heart. So I ask you that give attention to this young man. Now Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, you see he dedicates his life to learning the Qur'an, learning the hadith. From a very young age, Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi had already memorized the entire Qur'an. When he was around 10 years old, he had already memorized the entire Qur'an cover to cover. And his father now financed him and sent him to schools to study. When he was 18 years old, his father sent him to Damascus, out of Nawa and to the major city, Damascus, because the resources there were much greater. Um, now the state of Damascus is very different from what it was not too long back. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon Damascus and Halab and all the cities in the country, in that area, that region in general. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them and preserve their lives, preserve their families, preserve their wealth and their, and, and, and their houses. A very sad situation. But there was a time where Damascus was the hub of knowledge. And when I say there was a time, I'm not talking about like historically thousands of years ago, even till recent times. People from across the world traveled to Damascus for knowledge. And Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi also traveled to Damascus to seek knowledge. The first school he went to is a school called Saramiya. He went there and studied there for a while. However, um, he was then encouraged to go to another school called Rawahiya. And the reason why he was told to go there is because there they actually had proper boarding. And Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, since he wasn't from Damascus, he required boarding. And while he was at the school of Rawahiya, he would give his day and night to studying knowledge. His classmates, they say, that he would attend 12 lectures a day. And each lecture was one hour. One hour. So that's 12 hours a day he was giving to class. And then he would revise for another 12 hours a day. So 24 hours a day of his was given just to seeking knowledge. And during his time in Rawahiya, he studied Arabi to its depth. He studied fiqh, hadith. He studied legal theory of Islamic law. When he was 24 years old, he then started teaching at the Ashrafiya school, which is another great school in Damascus. Now you're 21 years old, you're an outsider, you're not from Damascus, and you're coming to one of the major schools and you're a teacher there. So there began to grow a buzz around Imam Nawawi's name. That who is this kid? Where did this talent come from? You know, what is this kid all about? And Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, his own teachers, his own students, his own classmates would all testify that he was a man that was from another world. They did not know. They would say, we didn't know if he even slept or if he even ate or if he, you know, we knew that he used to pray and do ibadah. But as far as whenever we saw him, he was always with his books and studying and studying and studying. And this is how a person gains knowledge. Knowledge isn't gained through partial studies, even though partial studies have their place in Islam. But if you really want to reach that point where you can really make a difference, where you can take it to the next level, if you really wish or desire to be an imam in a science, then you have to know that you need to give it your all. Imam Abu Yusuf rahmatullahi alayhi would tell his students, الْعِلْمُ لَا يُعْطِيكَ بَعْضُهُ حَتَّى تُعْطِيهِ كُلَّهُ That knowledge will not give you a portion of itself until and only until you dedicate your entire self to knowledge. You need to become a slave and servant for knowledge. When knowledge calls you, you will go. When knowledge is in front of you, you will sit respectfully in front of knowledge. 
And it was these people who gave their life to knowledge who ended up becoming great Imams. When I used to study in Madrasa, there was one great scholar from India who came to visit our Madrasa. His name was Sheikh Siddiq Bandwi, great scholar. And I recall when he came to visit us, one student asked him, he said to him, Sheikh, how did you reach such a high maqam, such a high rank? Where he, mashallah, he is a writer in so many sciences and had a, a, a phenomenal school and produced such great students. So he said, if you want to know where I am today, you ask the perfect question, where did I start one day? Because when you look at Imams and where they are today as their end result, it's very easy to get deluded into the fame cloud. You have to go and put yourself where they started off. One of my teachers used to say, Hamne to baghair dal ki dal khaiye. That there was a time in the beginning of our studies that we had dal without dal. Dal is like a lentil uh, soup, right? We had a lentil curry without any lentil in there. It was like we were facing pure poverty. Like you could have probably done wudu with that, with that soup or whatever they called it, right? Whatever dal they called it. These are people who made a tremendous sacrifice. Sheikh Siddiq Bandwi says that I went to the madrasa to study. When I arrived there, I applied for admission. And they said to me that they would give free education. They would give me free hostel, free place to stay. But they wouldn't provide me food for free. They said you had to, I had to do my own food. So he said, in the lunch hour when all the students would take a two hour nap, Sheikh Siddiq, he said, I would go to the village and there was a Hindu man there, I would work for him. And my job was to carry two buckets from his house, walk one mile, fill it up with water, and walk one mile back. That was his, that was his job. Now for someone who wasn't a bodybuilder, or someone who didn't spend too much of his time in a gym, doing yoga, you know, drinking protein shakes, Sheikh Siddiq Bandwi says, this was something very hard for me. It was very hard for me to walk with the buckets, first of all, one mile while they were empty, then filling them up would break my back, then carrying them for one mile would also hurt me more. And this person that I had to deliver the water to didn't live on the first floor, he lived on one of the higher floors. So I'd have to walk up the stairs with the buckets. And he says there were times in my life that I would reach the second or third floor and the bucket would slip from my hand. And I'd have to go all over again. He said at some times I would sit by the side of the road and I would cry to Allah and say, Ya Allah, such a high price for knowledge. Such difficulty. His mother and father couldn't help him. His mom actually told him very clearly at the beginning, My son, if you want to seek knowledge, I won't be a barrier, but I want you to know that it has to be your choice and it has to be your sacrifice. Because he had two sisters who both had disabilities. And his mother said, I've given my life to them and I can't work for you and I can't help you in any way. So he was on his own. He would work and do this every day until one day what happened was, there was another kid who joined the madrasa from his same city, Banda. Another kid from the same city joined the madrasa. And that kid applied for admissions and they told him the same thing. You can stay for free, you can study for free, but you can't eat for free. So the kid thought to himself, if I can't eat here, how am I going to live? I'm just going to go back home. So he kind of packed up his bags, he was ready to go back home. When Sheikh Siddiq came to him and said, where are you going? He explained the situation. Sheikh Siddiq said to him that I work for this man in the village. And every day after I deliver him two buckets of water, he gives me one piece of bread. Half, bread of your, half of the one bread is yours if you study hard. And now he was sharing the one bread he had into half with another student. These were people who made a great sacrifice. And Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi is at the top of that list that he made such a sacrifice. He had very little things that he possessed. Some scholars say one of his students who was known as an Nawawi as sughra his name was Ibn al-Attar. Ibn al-Attar is the major biographer of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. One of his students, someone who always had eyes on Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. Ibn al-Attar says that all he possessed was a turban and a long gown. Everything else he just picked up from here and there and made ends meet. Otherwise, all he actually possessed in his wardrobe was a turban and a long gown. And the reason why he possessed a turban, it's because it was a tradition for students of knowledge and scholars of hadith to wear a turban when they would teach. So he would wear a turban when he sat down. The only thing he would eat was cake and olives that his father would send him from Nawah. Because he was sure, he was certain that that was food that was earned through a permissible income. That was earned through a permissible source. So that's the only thing he would eat, the food sent by his father. Because he knew that if he polluted his body with something that was doubtful, it would leave a spiritual scar. And that spiritual scar would stop him and prevent him and become a barrier from the person who he wanted to become. Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, he would avoid many permissible things 
just so that he can, just, so, just out of the doubt or the fear that these things may be doubtful. And there are many scholars who actually teach us this lesson that a person can only gain the highest levels of taqwa if you learn to sacrifice certain halal things. Just because it's halal doesn't mean you should do it. Doesn't mean you have to do it. There are many things in the sharia that are halal that we should avoid altogether. Uh, for example, overeating. Or for example, eating, just eating less. You know, there were scholars in the past who ate less. Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi was known for fasting continuously. And he would only have one meal. And the other meal he would drink water. And when he would drink water, even that, he wouldn't drink cold water because he feared that if he drank cold water, it would make him drowsy. So he would drink warm water. He would drink warm water. There was one scholar who I met from India. His name is Sheikh Yunus Jonpuri. He is known as being one of the leading scholars of our time. In particular, in the subcontinent, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh area, he is recognized as the most advanced hadith scholar alive at this time. Sheikh Yunus Jonpuri. I had the honor of doing hajj with him on multiple occasions. And one time I asked him, I said to him, Sheikh, because this guy was phenomenal. I remember once we were sitting in his hotel room after Asr Salah, and we were just sitting there, he was an old man, he was lying down. And one Algerian scholar walked in, young guy, such a handsome young guy, wearing a turban, had a beautiful beard, was wearing very nice clothes. He walked in and he introduced himself and the Sheikh asked him, what do you do? He said, I teach hadith. The Sheikh asked him, what do you teach? He said, I teach Sahih al-Bukhari. Sheikh Yunus said to him, do you have any questions regarding Sahih al-Bukhari? Ask me. Because Sheikh Yunus is a master of Sahih al-Bukhari. I mean, that guy knows Sahih al-Bukhari probably better than Bukhari knew it. I'm just joking. But you know, he really knew it very well. So the man said to him, that I've been teaching Sahih al-Bukhari for a while, but the one thing that confuses me is the sequence that Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi used to set his abwab, set his chapters. It seems like his chapters are all over the place. It doesn't seem like there's some kind of flow. There doesn't seem to be, like you know, there doesn't seem to be a nice sequence. It seems to be all over the place. So Shaykh Yunus, when he heard such a big accusation against Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, even though it wasn't an accusation, it was more of a question, he sat up right away. And he said to the students, bring my turban. And he put his turban on his head. And then after that he said, listen carefully. And he said to this man, who was an adult, who came to visit him, he said, and don't just listen, write what I tell you. And then between Asr and Maghrib, he went through the sequence of all of the abwab of Sahih al-Bukhari off by heart. It's like the man has Sahih al-Bukhari memorized. And one day I was pushing him out of Haram, on his wheelchair, out of Majid al-Nabwi. And while I was pushing him out, one person came, after Salah, random guy, he came and shook his hand and he said, Salaamu Alaikum Shaykh, Dua, Dua. And the Shaykh said, Inshallah. Then another man came, he was African. He came and shook the, hand, sh- shook the Shaykh's hand and he said, Shaykh, Dua, Dua. The Shaykh said, Inshallah. And then, you know, in Saudi Arabia, how it works in the Haramain, one person does something, the next guy does it, the next guy does it, the next guy does it. And before you do it, there's this large group of people around him that are trying to shake his hand, shake his hand and everyone's saying, Shaykh, Dua, Shaykh, Dua. So all the cameras in the Haram started turning in our direction. And that's when I knew that this night wasn't going to end too well. So a little while, the shurta, the police came in and they started pushing and shoving everyone out of the way. Get out of the way here. Zahma mamnu, zahma mamnu. It's not permissible to congregate. Everyone get out of here. So one of the cops, he came to the front and lifted his hand. And he said to the sheikh, get out of the masjid. Why are you breaking the laws? Leave right now. So the sheikh then said to me, hurry up, take me out. So we were pushing him out. And while we were pushing him, he was in tears. He was crying. I said to him, Sheikh, I apologize on behalf of the police officer if he offended you. The Sheikh said, no, no, I'm not offended at all by him. He was just doing his job. These tears are actually not of fear, regret, or pain. These tears are of joy. Then he said, today the world is shaking my hands in the haram. But there was a time where I was a young kid whose name was Yunus from a small town in India called Jonpur. My destiny was to never be known. I was going to play in the mud, live in the mud, and die in the mud. But then a day came where I fell in love with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, there was, a, there was a time in my student life where while the students around me would be sleeping, I'd be sitting in the night, in the light of the moon, writing down hadith. Because that was the only light I had available. He said, I knew the exact calendar of the lunar calendar because I knew which nights I would have more time writing hadith and which nights I would have less time writing hadith. 
And this man dedicated so much of his life to hadith that Sheikh Yunus Jonpuri is from those scholars who dedicated his entire life to hadith and never got married. He never got married his entire life, dedicated his entire life to hadith. And before you start thinking, wow, that's a really weird thing to do, because I kind of understand it does sound like a weird thing to do. Imam Nawawi is one of those people too. He never got married his entire life. He dedicated his entire life to hadith, day and night. I asked Shaykh Yunus, I said to him, why is it that you didn't get married? So he said, I am from the group of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. We are a people who when the time for marriage came, we had no desire in marriage. The only love we had was with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He said, if I had gotten married at that phase in my life, that stage in my life, I would have oppressed my wife because I wouldn't have had no interest in her at all. So I saved myself from dhulm, and I engaged in the one thing that my heart loved the most, and that was studying the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, studying the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. This is Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, for his teaching, he never accepted compensation except for the first two years. The first two years he accepted compensation. Otherwise, the rest of it he taught waqf lillah, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even those first two years he taught, he used this compensation to purchase books, which later on he gave as a gift to the madrasa itself. He didn't walk away with any money from his teaching. But again, Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi came from a family. His father was a, he was a businessman, he was a merchant. So he was getting his finance, you know, it was flowing in from his family. When the Chief Justice Tajuddin al Subki was once asked to complete Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi's work, Al Majmu'. There was some part of it left. He said, can you please complete it? Someone asked Tajuddin Subki. So he excused himself by saying that, I can't fulfill the project of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi because I don't have the same number of books he had. Because Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi had a small little room. And in his room, if the books were out, he couldn't sleep. He had to pile all the books up in one corner in order for himself to be able to lie down. Which shows us first thing how tiny his room was. And the second thing we learn is, I mean, how tiny his room was, college life, be patient, a day will come when you'll li outlive that college phase. Um, but then, the second thing we learn is Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, he also had so many books. You know, day and night, he would just sit and read and read and read. I was telling the students at the Qalam Seminary earlier today, or yesterday it was, that one of my teachers, Sheikh um, Ahmad Umarji, rahimahullah, he was a teacher of ours who loved books. He loved books so much that he spent his day and night with books. If you wanted to search for him while he was on campus at the, in the madrasa, while he was in the madrasa, if you were searching for him, if he wasn't in the masjid reading salah, or in the classroom teaching, there was only one place he would be. Where is that? The library. He would even take his meals there. He would only take his meals in the library. He would tell the students, bring my meals here, let me take my meals in the library. And subhanAllah, Two, three years ago, he also passed away in the library. He was sitting after Fajr Salah reading some books of hadith. And that's when Malakul Maut must have come to him and extracted his soul. And he leaned forward. When they found his body, he was lying in the, in, in the, in the maktab, in the library, over his books. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'ah. Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi lived a very short life. Towards the end of his life, he returned back to the city of Nawa. The ruler of the time didn't like Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi too much because Imam Nawawi was a very prominent person. And also Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi had no interest in the corruption of the rulers of the, of the time. So he kind of expelled Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. He didn't really expel them but asked him to leave. Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi left. He then went to visit his teachers and colleagues in Damascus. Then after that he went to Jerusalem. Then on the way back he went to Nawa. And he stayed there for a while. He then fell ill and passed away in the city of Nawa on the 24th of Rajab in the year 676. He died at the age of 44. 44 years old. There are many of us in this gathering that are actually older than Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi was. Yet in his short life, he made such a tremendous dedication, wrote so many books, they say, they say that until Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi wrote his commentary on Sahih Muslim, Sahih Muslim wasn't commentated on properly. The sharah of Sahih Muslim was naqis, it was incomplete. 
until Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi came and he commentated on, uh, on, 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 on the Sahih Muslim. There is a scholar by the name of Abu Abbas, he says that Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi had reached mastery in all three major areas. And what are these three major areas he's referring to? First of all, knowledge. Second of all, zuhd, asceticism, his dislike for the world, like you're not getting involved with the, the bling of the world, just living a very simple life, his focus being on Allah and the hereafter. And the third thing, he was also a master, when first and foremost, is a commentary on the Shafi'i fiqh, uh, al Majmu. The second is his very famous work, the commentary on Sahih Muslim, it's called Sharh Sahih Muslim. He then wrote a famous book called Riyad al-Salihin, which I'm sure many of you have read or have been a part of a halaqa or a class where it was being taught. I believe every masjid in the world probably has a copy of the Riyadh al-Salihin and I'm not exaggerating, which again shows his acceptance. And then also um, from the many books is one of this book right here, Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi's Arba'een, his 40 hadith collection. There, were more, there, were, there are many, many collections of 40 hadith by the way. Imam Nawawi isn't the only collector of 40 hadith and neither is he the first collector of 40 hadith. He's just another collector. But what makes his collection so special? The scholars, they say, along with his ilm and his accuracy in collecting hadith, along with that, it was his piety. It was the foundation behind it. You know, there are some people who have so much knowledge, they have so much information, may I say, but there's little acceptance. But then there are some people who have little information, little knowledge, but there's acceptance from Allah. That's why my teacher used to always say, قَابِلِيَتْ أَلَقْ جِزِهِ قُبُولِيَتْ أَلَقْ جِزِهِ Qabiliyat, to have the ability to do something, that's one thing. But along with having your ability, you also have to have qubuliya, which means acceptance from Allah. Hence Ibrahim alayhi salam, after he finishes the construction of the Kaaba, he just proved his qabiliyah by building the Kaaba, his ability. But he doesn't just walk away, go home and start binge watching on Netflix. Ibrahim alayhi salam knows that he, there's still something else he needs to do. And he stands with his son Ismail in front of the Kaaba and they make the dua, Rabbana taqabbal minna. Qubuliya. Ya Allah, we proved our qabiliya here, but now we need your qubuliya, we need your acceptance. So let's get into the introduction of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. What is this book about? So one thing we know for sure, Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, in this book, he is collecting 40 hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, first of all, FYI, this book does not have 40 hadith, it has 42 hadith. Okay, first thing. But the reason why it's called a 40 hadith collection is to round it up to the 40 because there is a virtue mentioned in some ahadith regarding 40 hadith collection. So before we get to all of that, I thought I would start off by actually reading the introduction of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi in his 40 hadith collection. He starts off by saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Qayyum samawati wal ardeen. مدبر الخلائق أجمعين باعث الرسل صلواته وسلامه عليهم إلى المكلفين لهدايتهم وبيان شرائع الدين بالدلال بالدلائل القطعية وواضحات البراهين أحمده على جميع نعمه وأسأله المزيد من فضله وكرمه. Now in this first part, more or less, he's praising Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. That's a summary of it, and he's also. Um, now, why is he praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because we know that any action you start, you always start in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is one hadith that tells us that any action that is started without the name of Allah has no barakah in it. So he starts off doing exactly that. The second thing is that any project you start or any, any goal that you want to take on, you always praise Allah at the beginning because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can give you the ability to complete that who can give you the ability to carefully and properly execute what it is you're going after. So that's why the importance of hamd, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, always praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the truth is that when a, person, when a person thoughtfully praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when a person thoughtfully praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's when you learn to build an intimate bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you fav him, fa praise Him for His favors upon you. You think about them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created the skies and the earth. He, was the one who, he is the one who maintains the skies and the earth. This hadith that I'm reading was delivered to us through the prophets, you know, and these ahadith are clear proofs 
And these ahadith were delivered to us because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the prophets. Ba'ith al-Rusul. Allah is the one who sent the prophets. And then he says, Ahmaduhu ala jami'i ni'amihi. I praise Allah for all of his favors. Wa as'aluhu al-mazidah min fadlihi wa karami. And I ask Allah to shower me with more of his favor and more of his honor. Then after that, he testifies in the oneness of Allah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah al-wahid al-qahar. Al-kareem al-ghaffar. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Wa habibuhu wa khaliluhu. أَفْضَلُ الْمَخْلُوقِينَ وَالْمُكَرَّمُ بِالْقُرْآنِ الْعَزِيزِ بِالْقُرْآنِ الْعَزِيزِ الْمُعْجِزَةِ الْمُسْتَمِرَّةِ عَلَى تَعَاقُبِ السِّنِينَ وَبِالسُّنَنِ الْمُسْتَنِيرَةِ لِلْمُسْتَرْشِدِينَ الْمَخْصُوصُ بِجَوَامِعِ الْكَلِمِ وَسَمَاحَةِ الدِّينِ صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ وَسَلَامُهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَى سَائِرِ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالْمُرْسَلِينَ وَآلِ كُلِّ وَآلِ كُلٍّ so in this part now, he's testifying in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he sends his salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and praises the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for being the one who is the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the servant and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who was honored by the miracle, the continuous miracle of the Qur'an, the honorable Qur'an, which was sent after a long drought. There was no revelation for such a long time. And then the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also blessed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with beautiful, with a beautiful sunnah. With a beautiful sunnah. And his, he was makhsus bi jawami al kalim. This is a very beautiful a praise he uses to praise the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What does that mean? Al makhsus bi jawami al kalim. Al makhsus means he was unique, he was special with this. Bi jawami al kalim with concise statements. The Prophet would make a small statement and 1400 years later, scholars are still commentating upon that one statement. Still going to the depth of it. You know, when I, I, I'm teaching hadith this year, Mishkat al-Masabih, to the students at the Qalam Seminary, those who are in the advanced years. And when I sit and teach them, sometimes we open up one hadith. There was one time we discussed one hadith for almost one hour. And one of the students in the class said to me, I never imagined there could be such commentary on a hadith for one hour. By the way, it wasn't one hour of stories and idur ki bekar baate. It was one hour of proper commentary. Like, you know, aqwal and opinions and how the hadith and what we derive from the hadith and the context of the hadith and the meaning of the hadith and how to implement that hadith. And as we were going through it, the students were amazed. And I said to them, this is the jawami al kalim of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had these precise and concise statements. And we'll learn this through the class. While we're reading these ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu will exercise many of these. He then says, Amma Ba'd. Amma Ba'd is a transitional statement. This is the statement you put inside your muqaddama or in your letter, in your introduction or in your letter, when you're done with the praise and ready to talk about and introduce the science in the book. So now he's ready to introduce the book. He said, فَقَدْ رَوَيْنَا أَنَ عَلِيِّ بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبْ وَعَبْدِ اللَّهِ بْنَ Jabal. وَأَبِي الدَّرْدَاء وَأَبْنُ عُمَرْ وَأَبْنُ عَبَّاسْ وَأَنَسْ بِنْ مَالِكْ وَأَبِي هُرَيْرَى وَأَبِي سَعِيدِ الْخُدِي رضي الله عنهم من طرق كثيرة بروايات متنوعات He says that we have, he narrates a bunch of sahaba and said that through all of these sahaba we receive one narration. And the narration comes to us through many pathways, meaning there are many chains that narrate this hadith. And what is this uh, genre of hadith? أَنَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ قَالْ مَنْ حَفِذَ على أمتي أربعين حديثا من أمر دينها بعثه الله تعالى يوم القيامة في زمرة الفقهاء والعلماء وفي رواية بعثه الله فقيها وعالما وفي رواية أبي الدرداء وكنت له يوم القيامة شافعا وشهيدا وفي رواية ابن مسعود قيل له أدخل من أي أبواب الجنة شئت وفي رواية ابن عمر كتب في زمرة العلماء وحشر في زمرة الشهداء so he narrates all these ahadith that the Prophet ﷺ said. Whoever memorizes 40 hadith, that's one interpretation or one translation of this hadith, or the more accurate translation of this hadith is, whoever preserves or safeguards 40 hadith for my ummah that relate to the matter of this religion. Meaning anyone that preserves 40 hadith for the ummah so people can come and learn them. What does that mean? Maybe preserves them as a book, writes them as a document. That's why I always tell my students that I encourage every Muslim to compile a 40 hadith collection. Every Muslim should compile a 40 hadith collection. You don't need to publish it, it doesn't need to go online, it doesn't need to be in an online bookstore. Just collect it for your own benefit. 
that these are my favorite 40 ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu As a Muslim, when I studied the Prophet's ahadith, when I read them, these are 40 ahadith that meant something to me. And you can choose a common theme, as Imam Nawawi will talk about up ahead. I would love to see someone collect 40 ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu that relate to the youth. We have 40 ahadith regarding the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and 40 ahadith on nikah, and 40 ahadith on this, and 40 ahadith on that. I once came across a 40 hadith collection. Um, it's called the 40 ahadith of Muhammad, which means there are 40 ahadith, and all the narrators in all 40 of these ahadith, guess what their names are? Muhammad. And Muhammad, Ibn Muhammad, Qala Muhammad, and Muhammad, Samia bin Muhammad, Hadathani Muhammad. That's kind of like what the channel narrator narration sounds like Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. And then there's another famous 40 hadith collection in which the author of the 40 hadith collection, what he did was he collected 40 ahadith. Are you guys ready? From, that's one, from 40 hadith. He collected 40 compilations of 40 hadith. I have that book at home, by the way. So there are 40 hadith collections, and this author collected 40 collections of 40 hadith collections. So this times 40 by 40, and that's how many ahadith are in that book, okay? Um, there's another one that I was referring to, in which the author, what he did was, this is prior to having access to easy transportation, he traveled to 40 different major cities and narrated one hadith from each of the major scholars there. So there are 40 hadith from 40 major cities. So these, the people had a different taste, a different spin on what they were looking for. They created a, a thesis, a hypothesis, what they wanted to accomplish, and then they collected 40 hadith. Now, the one who does this, what's their reward? One hadith says that they will be resurrected in the group of the scholars and jurists. One hadith says that that person will be resurrected as a scholar and a jurist. One hadith says that that person, um, I will intercede on behalf of that person and I will testify on behalf of that person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One hadith tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to that person, enter into whichever door of Jannah you want to enter through. Subhanallah. And one hadith says that his name will be written in the group of scholars and he will be resurrected with the group of the martyrs. Now after narrating all these ahadith, Imam Nabi rahmatullahi alayhi, what does he say? He says, وَاتَّفَقَ الْحُفَّاضُ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ حَدِيثٌ ضَعِيفٌ وَإِنْ كَثُرَتْ تُرُقُهُ He said, after I shared all these narrations regarding 40 ahadith and their virtue, all the scholars who are masters in hadith, the huffad, the masters of hadith are in consensus that the ahadith relating to preserving 40 hadith are all weak. Even though they come through many chains, what is Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi himself saying? They are all weak. But just because they're weak, does that, imam, does that mean Imam Nawawi is not going to write this book? Does that mean Imam Nawawi isn't going to write this book? A weak hadith still has a place in the religion. And he's going to address that very soon. So how he addresses it is very interesting. He starts off by saying, there were other scholars before me who practiced, practiced these ahadith too. So he's kind of taking the blame off himself. He said there were other scholars who did it as well. And he starts off by saying, وَقَدْ صَنَّفَ الْعُلَمَاءُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ فِي هَذَا الْبَابِ مَا لَا يُحْصَى مِنَ الْمُصَنَّفَاتِ So many books have been written in this genre of 40 hadith collections that you can't even count them. فَأَوَّلُ مَنْ عَلِمْتُهُ صَنَّفَ فِيهِ The first scholar who I know, Imam Nabawi is saying, who wrote a 40 hadith collection was Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. ثُمَّ Muhammad ibn Aslam al-Tusi. ثُمَّ الْحَسَنْ ibn Sufyan al-Nasawi. وَأَبُو بَكَرْ الْآجُرِّ وَأَبُو بَكَرْ مُحَمَّدْ بِنْ إِبْرَاهِيمْ الْأَصْفَهَانِ وَالدَّارْ قُطْنِ وَالْحَاكِمْ وَأَبُو نُعِيمْ وَأَبُو عَبْدِ الرَّحْمَانَ السُّلَمِ وَأَبُو سَعِيد الْمَالِينِ وَأَبُو عُثْمَانْ الصَّابُنِ وَعَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنْ مُحَمَّدَ الْأَنْصَارِ وَأَبُو بَكَرْ الْبَيْهَقِ And he says there are so many of them. He lists a bunch of them and says, and you know, there are so many of them who've written in this field. And for those of you who know these names, you know that each of the people he named are giants. They are considered as a point of reference in their fields of expertise. Then after that he says, وَقَدْ اسْتَخَرْتُ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى فِي جَمْعِ أَرْبَعِينَ حَدِيثًا Then I made istikhara to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on collecting 40 ahadith. اِقْتِدَاءً بِهَا أُولَاءِ الْأَئِمَّةِ الْأَعْلَامِ So I can follow those great scholars and their practice. وَحُفَّاضِ الْإِسْلَامِ And the protectors of Islam. وَقَدْ اِتَّفَقَ الْعُلَمَاءُ عَلَى جَوَازِ الْعَمْلِ بِالْحَدِيثِ الضَّعِيفِ فِي الْفَضَائِلِ الْأَعْمَالِ He says the scholars agree that it is permissible to practice upon weak narrations when it comes to matters of virtue. Now, just because it's weak doesn't mean it's discarded. And just because it's weak doesn't mean it's practiced. 
Even when it comes to the matters of virtues, there are certain conditions that must be met. The scholars, they say there are three conditions that must exist in a weak narration in order for it to be practiced. What is the first thing? The weak hadith is related to virtues and it has reminder in it, it reminds us, it, it, it encourages us to do good deeds. It is not related to legal rulings, ahkam, and neither, neither does it relate to um, aqidah, creed, belief. Because you cannot establish your creed through a weak narration. Everyone understand that? And neither can you establish a fiqhi ruling through a weak narration. The second thing, the weakness cannot be extremely weak. It could be weak because even weak narrations are of different degrees. Which is such a beautiful thing in our Islam that we have this detailed concept of what is a weak narration, what isn't a weak narration. And the third thing, the hadith must not contradict a proper understanding, an established understanding of Islam or a general principle Islam of Islam. It can't bring anything new and it shouldn't contradict something that's already established. So now Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi, by the way, for those people who have a problem with, with weak narrations, you're gonna have a big problem with a person by the name of Muhammad bin Ismail. I recall once I was in a discussion, and during the discussion I quoted a hadith. And the person in front of me said, who's the rawi? I said, Muhammad bin Ismail. He said that he's a weak narrator. What did he say? He's a weak narrator, and the hadith you quoted is weak. I said, well, the hadith I quoted is weak, that's true. But the fact that you're saying Muhammad bin Ismail is a weak narrator, that's not true. Because Imam Muhammad bin Ismail's more common name is Imam Bukhari. Uski hawa udar nikal gayi. He went quiet. He's like, oh man, you played me, Shaykh. I didn't know that Imam Bukhari's real name was Muhammad bin Ismail. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi wrote many books, by the way. And not all of his books only consisted of authentic narrations. Imam, Imam Bukhari himself says, I have memorized 200,000 authentic narrations, and I have memorized 100,000. Uh, uh, no, sorry, the other way around. 200,000 weak narrations, 100,000 authentic narrations. And in his Sahih al-Bukhari, he has no more than 7,000 ahadith. So if you believe Imam Bukhari's goal was to collect all the Sahih hadith in the world, he himself shows a discrepancy of 93,000 ahadith. And Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi wrote another book called Al-Adab al-Mufrad, which is a commonly taught book to students of knowledge. People read it all the time. Maybe sometimes in our community, maybe at some point in our community, we can cover Al-Adab al-Mufrad as well. In there, Imam, Nabi brings, Imam Bukhari brings weak narrations too. So th this understanding that weak narrations have no place in the deen is not a traditional understanding. It's not the understanding of the muhaddithin. And Imam Nabi rahmatullahi alayhi right here is just blowing it out the window. But he says, even though I'm going to compile this 40 hadith, وَمَعَ هَذَا فَلَيْسَ يَعْتِمَادِي عَلَى هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ I'm not doing it because of the hadith of the 40 hadith. That's not why I'm compiling this 40 hadith. It's not because of the weak narrations above. The reason why I'm compiling 40 hadith, he says, بَلْ عَلَى قَوْلِهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ فِي الْأَحَادِيثِ الصَّحِيحَةِ لِيُبَلِّغُ الشَّاهِدُ مِنْكُمْ الْغَائِبِ It's because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in his farewell sermon of Hajjat al -Wada, he said, those who are present should convey my word to those who are not present. I'm following that hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he said, "وَقَوْلِهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ نَظَرَ اللَّهُ إِمْرَأً سَمِعَ مَقَالَتِي فَوَعَاهَا فَأَدَّاهَا كَمَا سَمِعَهَا." May Allah subhanahu wa taala enlighten or brighten the face of the one who heard my statement, and he preserved it and then conveyed it to someone else just as he heard it, meaning didn't cause any change. As Muslims, we are very particular how we narrate the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu And if you're not sure of the exact statement that you're narrating, then always add at the end of it, أو كما قال. أو كما قال means something similar to this is what the Prophet sallallahu said. Then he says, ثُمَّ مِنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ مَنْ جَمَعَ الْعَرْبَعِينَ فِي أُصُولِ الدِّينَ وَبَعْضُهُمْ فِي الْفُرُوعِ وَبَعْضُهُمْ فِي الْجِهَادِ وَبَعْضُهُمْ فِي الزُّهْدِ وَبَعْضُهُمْ فِي الْعَدَابِ وَبَعْضُهُمْ فِي الْخُطَبِ وَكُلُّهَا مَقَاسِدُ صَالِحَةٌ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ مَقَاسِدِيهَا He said that many scholars came, they, they compiled 40 ahadith with different intentions. Some, schol some scholars compiled 40 hadith on the usul, the principles of the deen, while some compiled 40 ahadith on the, on the furu', the lower issues of the deen, while some scholars compiled a 40 hadith collection just on the topic of jihad, and some scholars compiled a 40 hadith collection just on zuhd, asceticism. Some scholars collected 40 hadith on the importance of adab, proper manner. Some compiled it, and then he continues on with all these different uh, reasons why they compiled. He says, وَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ جَمِيعَ أَرْبَعِينَ أَهَمَّ مِنْ هَذَا كُلِّهِ وَهِيَ أَرْبَعُونَ حَدِيثًا مُشْتَمِلَةً عَلَى جَمِيعِ ذَلِكَ He said, however, I have a plan. 
And my plan is not to compile a 40 hadith collection on one subject. It's to compile a 40 hadith collection that covers all the subjects. It's going to be all inclusive. I want to bring everything into it. وَكُلُّ حَدِيثٍ مِنْهَا قَاعِدَةٌ عَظِيمَةٌ مِنْ قَوَاعِدِ الدِّينِ And every hadith I will compile in this book will be a principle from the principles of the deen. وَقَدْ وَصَّفَهُ الْعُلَمَاءُ بِأَنَّ um, Sorry. وَقَدْ وَصَّفَهُ الْعُلَمَاءُ بِأَنَّ مَدَارِ الْإِسْلَامِ عَلَيْهِ وَهُوَ نِصْفُ الْإِسْلَامِ أَوْ ثُلُثُهُ أَوْ نَحْمِ ذَلِكَ And he said, I will bring certain ahadith that scholars themselves will say regarding these ahadith. That these ahadith are, some of them are half of iman. Some of them are one third of iman. Meaning these are big, uh, very important principles that are a part of our religion. Now he starts closing off by saying, ثُمَّ أَنْتَزِمُوا فِي هَذِي أَرْبَعِينَ أَنْ تَكُونَ صَحِيحَةً وَمُعْظَمُهَا فِي صَحِيحِ الْبُخَارِ وَمُسْلِمْ He said, I will, my goal is to bring only authentic narrations in this 40 hadith collection. That's a very unique thing of Imam Nawawi's works, and in this one in particular. He said, most of the ahadith that I will be quoting will be found in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. He then says, وَأَذْكُرُهَا مَحْذُوفَةَ الْإِسْنَادِ I will cut out the chain of narrators, because if I bring each chain with each narration, it's just going to become too long and too blown out. So he says, I have removed the chain of narrators. Why? لِيَسْهُلَ حِفْظُهَا وَيَعُمُّ الْإِنْتِفَاعُ بِهَا inshallah. So those who wish to memorize these 40 hadith can easily do so. It'll be very easy for you to memorize it. I've shortened the hadith. And he said also, it'll be easy to benefit from it. Then he says, ثُمَّ أَتْبِعُهَا بِبَابٍ فِي ضَبْتِ الْخَفِيلِ الْفَاضِهَا He said, if there's any, ever any words that are a little complicated, I will also help you understand them too. وَيَنْبِغِي لِكُلِّ رَاغِبٍ فِي الْآخِرَةِ أَنْ يَعْرِفَ هَذِهِ الْأَحَادِيثِ Anyone who has an intention or is desirous towards the hereafter should dedicate time to learn these ahadith لِمَا إِشْتَمَرَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ الْمُهِمَّاتِ Because they consist of very important subjects. وَاحْتَوَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ التَّنْبِيهِ عَلَى جَمِيعِ الطَّاعَاتِ And it also, it also covers and, and highlights the good deeds that a person needs to bring in their life. وَذَلِكَ ظَاهِرٌ لِمَنْ تَدَبَّرْ and, and what I am saying, the importance of this book will be apparent to whoever reads this book. Then he says, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ اِعْتِمَادِي I trust Allah وَإِلَيْهِ تَفْوِيدِي وَإِسْتِنَادِي And I, I rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ وَالنِّعْمَ And I, all praises for Allah and all favors are for Allah وَبِهِ التَّوْفِيقُ وَالْعِسْمَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guides and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who protects. Now, We've covered the introduction of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. Two quick things that are left before we close the class. One thing, we're going to be studying 40 hadith, so it only makes sense if we define what the word hadith means. So what does the word hadith mean? Literally, lughatan, from a dictionary standpoint, the word hadith means something new. Ziddul qadim. It's the opposite of something old. And the reason why... Now, hadith is also used to refer to speech. And the reason why speech is called hadith is because every time you say something, it's something new. It has a beginning. You initiated a statement. Before you initiated it, that statement didn't exist. So that's why hadith is there. Dhiddul qadim as an opposite, to, as opposing to um, something old. Now technically, when we use the term hadith, what does it mean? مَا أُضِيفَ إِلَى النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم مِنْ قَوْلٍ أو فِعْلٍ أو تَقْرِيرٍ أو صِفَةٍ خلقي أو خلقي أو خلقي. What does that mean? That whatever is attributed towards the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whatever is attributed towards the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from his statements, anything he said, it's now considered a hadith. Or his actions, anything he did, is now considered a hadith. أو تقرير or something happened in his presence and he remained silent to it, that's considered a hadith as well. Because the reason why that's something important is because had it not been permissible, the Prophet ﷺ would have immediately prohibited, stopped that act. Because he was a Prophet. He would not allow something haram to happen in his presence. Or a characteristics of his, or a characteristic, characteristic or a description of his that describes his physical features or his internal character. So someone saying that the Prophet ﷺ was more beautiful than the full moon. That's a hadith too. Because it's describing his physical features. Or someone saying the Prophet ﷺ was more modest than the newly wed while she is sitting inside her hawdaj, sitting inside her little camp, her little carriage. They're describing his characteristics. So now that we understand a hadith, 
It is also important to know a hadith are of different grades. There are authentic narrations, there are hasan, good narration, there are weak narrations, and then there are some narrations that are absolutely fabricated. If, we're interested in, if you are interested in learning more detail on these terms and the different types and what their, definition, what their definition is, you'll need to study a more advanced and more detailed class. There's a class that I teach actually in this masjid in the summer called the hadith intensive, in which we actually cover all of this and much more in a lot of detail. So we invite you to that class. Otherwise, there are many books on this and there are many courses online that are easily available. The last thing I want to cover before I close today, it is, it is a tradition that when we study hadith, since next week we're going to start the first hadith, it is a tradition that before you study a collection of hadith, you cover the hadith known as Al-Musalsal bil awwaliyah This is the first hadith every student hears from their teacher. When I sat in front of my teachers, the first hadith they taught us was Musalsal bil awwaliya Musalsal means something with continuity. al awwaliya means the first hadith. There are many ahadith like this. For example, Musalsal bil Musafaha. Every time the student studies this hadith from their teacher, what do they do? They shake the teacher's hand. Musalsal bil Tabassum. Every time you study this hadith from your teacher, you smile. Because a Sahabi, when he heard this hadith from the Prophet, he smiled. And then when he taught it to his student, he told his student, you must smile too. And his student made his student smile. So similarly, musalsal bil ma'i wa tamar. That the, the, the hadith, that when you teach this hadith, the teacher gives the student two dates and some water. Some zamzam water. These are all different types of hadith. So there's one called musalsal bil awaliyah. The hadith in which, it's the first hadith every student hears from their teacher. So I will share this hadith with you inshallah and aziz while also sharing my entire chain of narration in this hadith. I heard the hadith of Musal Sal bin Awaliyah from my dear teacher, Sheikh Yusuf bin Sulaiman, who taught me this hadith in England while I was studying in the Darul Uloom uh, in the outskirts of Manchester in a small little village called Ramsbottom. And he studied it from his teacher, Sheikh Muhammad Zakaria Kandalvi, who studied it from his teacher, Sheikh Yahya. And this was the first hadith he heard from his teacher, Sheikh Rashid Ahmed Gangohi. And this was the first hadith he heard from his teacher, Sheikh, from his teacher, Sheikh Abdul. Ghani Mujaddidi Dehlawi, and this was the first hadith he heard from his teacher, Sheikh Shah Ishaq Dehlawi, and this was the first hadith he heard from his teacher, Sheikh Shah Abdul Aziz Dehlawi. And then from there, I'm just going to read the rest of the hadith and the rest of the chain in Arabic, inshallah. And he heard from his teacher, Shah Waliullah, who says, Haddathini Sayyid Umar min lavdihi tujahi qabrin Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that I heard the hadith from my teacher, Sayyid Umar while I was standing in front of the grave of the Prophet sallallahu And this was the first hadith I heard from my teacher. قال أخبرنا به الشيخ المحقق سعيد بن محمد المقري قال وهو أول حديث سمعته من عن ولي الكامل أحمد الحج الوهراني قال وهو أول حديث سمعته من عن الشيخ الإسلام عارف بالله سيد إبراهيم التازي قال وهو أول حديث سمعته من قال قرأته على المحدث الرباني أبي الفتح محمد بن أبي بكر بن حسين المراغي قال وهو أول حديث قرأته عليه قال سمعت من لفظ شيخنا زين الدين عبد الرحيم بن حسين العراقي قال وهو أول حديث سمعته منه قال حدثنا أبو الفتح محمد بن محمد بن إبراهيم البكر الميدومي قال وهو أول حديث سمعته منه قال أخبرنا أن نجيب أبو الفرج عبد اللطيف بن عبد النعيم أب المنعم الحراني قال وهو أول حديث سمعته منه قال أخبرنا الحافظ أبو الفرج عبد الرحمن بن الجوزي قال وهو أول حديث سمعته منه قال أخبرنا أبو سعيد إسماعيل بن أبي صالح النيشافوري قال وهو أول حديث سمعته منه قال أخبرنا والدي أبو صالح أحمد بن عبد الملك المؤذن قال وهو أول حديث سمعته منه قال أخبرنا أبو طاهر محمد بن محمد محمش الزبادي قال وهو أول حديث سمعته منه قال أخبرنا أبو حامد أحمد بن محمد بن يحيى البزاز قال وهو أول حديث سمعناه منه قال حدثنا عبد الرحمن بن بشر بن حكم قال وهو أول حديث سمعته منه قال أخبرنا سفيان من عيينة قال وهو أول حديث سمعته من أن عمر بن دينار أن أبي قابوس مولى عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص أن عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص رضي الله عنهما أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال هذه سجدة حديث الراحمون يرحمهم الرحمن تبارك وتعالى 
Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamukum man fil sama. Those are rahimun, yarhamuhum arhaman. Those who are merciful, the merciful will show mercy to them. Those who are merciful amongst you, the merciful will show mercy to you. Irhamu man fil ard. Have mercy on those that are in the earth. Yarhamukum man fil sama. The one in the heavens will have mercy upon you. This hadith is musalsal bil awaliyya. And inshallah, al aziz, next Wednesday we will start with the first hadith that Imam Nabawi rahmatullahi alayhi gathers and his collection of 40. Um, there's one last little nukta that I forgot to mention that I'll mention to you right now. This 40 hadith collection of Imam, of Imam Nabawi rahmatullahi alayhi wasn't originally his. There was a scholar of hadith by the name of Ibn Salah. Ibn Salah started writing a 40 hadith collection but was unable to complete it. He compiled 24 ahadith and he was unable to complete it. So Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi started from where he left off and added another 28 ahadith, which made it how many in total? 42 ahadith. So that's the background to this, uh, this collection as well. Khair, we'll stop here. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What time is it? We have 20 minutes left for the Adhan. If anyone has any questions, we'll take them now, inshallah, on Aziz. Otherwise, we can break up. Yes? So, Jazakallah, uh, Shaykh. I hope I still get that question. Of course, please. Any question you have, I'll try my best to answer it. I can't guarantee an answer. I'll try to answer. No, I know you can answer, Shaykh. I'm not sure if you're here to ask the question. I asked you a question, but you answered before I asked the question. So, you said the 40 Hadith collection from Canada. Is there a 40 collection for your Hadith of vegan? Just because a scholar collected 40 ahadith, so the question is that there are 40 hadith collections, are those ahadith in their week? Not necessarily. No, no, no. I'm asking, is there a collection? Because you know, different people use different criteria to come up with the 40 ahadith. Yes. Different scholars use different criteria to collect 40 ahadith. So people had different criteria. Some scholars, the ahadith they collected had weak narrations. Some, some scholars like Imam Nawawi only collected, <coughs> only collected authentic narrations. So each scholar is different in their approach. So is there any criteria for Imam Nawawi? Imam Nawawi, yes, he says very clearly, I have only collected authentic narrations. Most of the narrations, he said in his introduction, most of the narrations I have collected can be found in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. So Imam Nawawi's collections are authentic. That's one thing beautiful. Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, even in his Riyadh al-Salihin, the ahadith he brings there are very authentic, which makes it easier upon the reader when they're reading. They don't have to worry about the authenticity of what they're reading. Any other questions? From the sister's side? Anything else here? No? Yes, one more question. Yeah. All the ahadith in Sahih al-Bukhari are strong, and there is no doubt in that. There is one famous muhaddith who raised objection to this, but he was, uh, he was refuted thoroughly that, there are, that the ahadith in Sahih al-Bukhari are absolutely authentic. The same, is true for the same rule does not apply to Sahih Sitta. Sahih Muslim is authentic, Sahih Bukhari is authentic. The other Sahih Sitta have weak narrations in them. They do have weak narrations in them. Now the question is then why are they called Siha Sitta? Why are they called the six authentic collections of hadith? Anyone ever wonder that? It's a very interesting story. Maybe someday I'll share it with you guys. It's a huge historical coincidence. It just happened. You know? The earlier scholars never heard of the term authentic, um, six uh, authentic collections of hadith. Imam Abu Dawood, Imam Tirmidhi, Imam Ibn Majah, Imam Nasa'i, Imam Malik. These guys had no idea this term even existed. Even after them, their students had no idea. This is hundreds of years later, what coincidentally this happened. There was a famous scholar who was a biographer of the hadith. What he would do is that he would read through the biography of the narrators, and he would write on them and do research on them. So one of his projects, what he did was, he compiled the narrators from these six collections of hadith and did a biography work on them. He chose these books. There's one person, he said, you know what, I have to do a biography work, my theory is going to be that, I, my, not my theory, my, my objective, my goal, my research method will be that I will do research on these six books. And after he wrote these six books together, compiled their biographies together, 
it just became so much more easier to cross-reference the ahadith in those books. So therefore, they started getting bunched together. And that's where, through time, then they started, the, the people started calling them the Siha Sitta. But what's a fact is that the, the, the other four books consist weak narrations, and Ibn Majah even has fabricated narrations. What did I say? Not too many, but there are a few. There's a handful of them that are even mutaham bil wadh. There are claims that they are, they are fabricated narrations. Wallahu alam swab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. This program as well, in which we do a sister's halaqa. I'll be starting a class for the sisters only on Saturday. It's called The Beginning of Guidance by Imam Ghazali. Phenomenal class, great class. I encourage all of you to come, the sisters and all the brothers. Send your sisters, send your wives, send your daughters. Bring them all to the class, inshallah, Aziz. It'll happen to this side of the masjid right here. If you're looking for the exact dates, the dates for the sisters' class, unfortunately, are kind of like a little kitchen They're a little mixed up. Some days are here, some days are there. If you want to know which dates the sisters' programs are on, you need to visit our... Masjid website, and there's a calendar there which has an update of all the programs that are happening and what time they're happening. Okay, so the calendar is updated. You can go there, you'll see it. Or a dish, or you know, another thing you can do is just download the Masjid app. The Masjid app is a great resource. You can use it for your salah time. Use it for knowing when the lectures are, when the programs are, and there's a lot. There are a lot of other features in there too. So that's another good resource for you guys as well. So inshallah, I look forward to seeing you all next week in the weeks ahead. Um, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept for those of you who want to uh, you can purchase a class of Mamnawi rahmatullahi alayhi so you can follow along bring a pen and paper because the class is not going to be an inspiration or a motivational lecture that's not the goal behind this the goal behind this class with the inspiration with the motivation is to deliver content this is our education series that's the goal behind these classes subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh